natural history. Hi, so my name's Danny, and I'll be your spider girl today. Now, there's just a couple things I'd like to point out before I start. First of all, I'm sure you guys can all see this big yellow tape going around my desk. We just don't want you guys to cross that during the presentation. We also request no flash photography, as it might upset my little critters here. And who you guys can all see in the big screen behind me is my superstar of the show, Britney Spears. And she is a very sweet Chilean rosehead tarantula. But they can also be found in parts of Bolivia and Argentina as well. Now, this particular kind of spider is known to be very timid and docile. They're often kept as pets, and we certainly handle them all the time. Now, tarantulas are arachnids, and that means they're not the same as insects. But can anyone tell me some differences between spiders and insects? Right here. Spiders have eight legs, or no, spiders have six legs, right? Mm -hmm. Insects have eight, Go back, Go back up, back up. So mm -hmm. spiders have eight legs, insects have six. That's absolutely correct. For anyone that didn't hear that, all spiders have eight legs, as opposed to the six that insects have. And you can see the four pairs going around our little tarantula here. Another difference is that all spiders have two body segments, as opposed to the three that insects have. And that consists of the cephalothorax region at the front, where all those legs are connected, and then the abdomen at the back. But your insects may also have wings and antennae. Instead, our tarantula has pedipalps. And the pedipalps are what look like shorter little legs at the very front of the body. But she uses them more like hands to manipulate her prey. And now it's a little hard to see because she's doing such a good job of hiding them, but she's also got chelicerate just between those pedipalps. So kind of just between there. They basically look like these two big meaty parts right in front of the face, and that's what's holding her venom glands, because just beneath those are her bangs. So she's nocturnal, she's gonna go out and hunt at night. So that's when she finds her prey, she immediately pounces on it, and then injects the venom through her fangs to paralyze her food. But she's not done that. She then needs to regurgitate digestive fluids onto it as well, and that's to bring down the insides of the insect. They don't have teeth like we do. They can't really chew their food. They first have to convert it all into a yummy insect smoothie in order to suck up properly. And they suck it up from their mouth, which is a little slit just behind those chelicerae. Now, even though she does have venom, if she were to bite me, it would be very similar to a bee sting, and actually something I could quite easily recover from. Now, out of 43,000 species of spider, there's only approximately 1% that has venom potent enough to kill you. That does include species like our black widow and brown recluse that we have at the front of the exhibit. But all spiders are much more afraid of us than we are of them. It's not in their interest to bite a human. It can actually take weeks to fully recover that venom again. So they're much happier to not go hungry, not waste that venom on us, but save it for their food. Just let us get on with our lives, as long as we can learn to do the same for them. But if we also take a look just behind those chelicerae, let's see if I can catch you a glance at her eyes. Now they're tiny little beady eyes, there they are, you can just about see them. I want you to guess how many she's got. Eight. Oh, I'm hearing eight. Eight is the correct answer. Yes, she absolutely does have eight eyes. But even though she's got so many, they're only very simple, which means she can just make out light and dark and only very basic shapes. However, not all spiders have the same amount of eyes, or even the same kind of eyes. And in fact, if you all look behind you, this guy's staring very intently at us. Yeah, it's not that lovely person in the scarf just behind. There we go. So that jumping spider with the big frowny face has those two large anterior median eyes. And they have a much higher acuity in them. That means he's got better eyesight. And he can judge distances. Now he needs that in order to jump from branch to branch to grab onto his prey without falling down. But our Chilean doesn't need excellent eyesight because she views the world around her using her sensory hairs more than anything else. And those are the hairs on her legs. So she can feel the world through vibrations and she can almost certainly feel the vibrations just from me talking right now. So for example, when you see spiders on a web, they're able to tell the difference between the soft movements of the wind touching their web compared with the sharp jerking movements an insect would make when cool. So they know when to stay still or hide in the shadows, when to pounce out at the opportune time. But having looked around the exhibit, I'm sure you all noticed how still our spiders are being. Now you can be totally honest. Did anyone think that they're fake or dead at all? Yeah, I'm getting a few nods here. People often think this because they're so still and we've got those little arrows pointing to them, right? But they are all very much alive and we double check every morning just to be sure. <laughs> but it's in their best interest to be so still for many reasons. 
the one or the owl species within this except they're nocturnal. So if they're going to be active at all, it's much more likely to be at night. The more still they are, the better camouflage they are. So less likely to be seen and eaten by predators. And last but not least, our spiders do not make very good long distance runners. They're much better at sprinting. And they want to conserve that energy as much as possible and only use it when it's really necessary. That's often feeding or mating. But their hairs have many functions. And if our little Brittany wanted to, she'd be able to climb right out of this cage. And sometimes they do. And that's all due to the very high surface area that those hairs create on the bottom of their feet. So it's actually due to Van der Waals forces that they're able to cling on so well. But also, she, like all other New World tarantulas, have urticating hairs on the abdomen. And urticating basically means irritating. They're sharp, the barbed hairs that they can kick off using their back legs in self-defense. So if she felt threatened by me and were to kick some of those hairs off of me, they could get stuck in my skin and be really itchy. It could even cause a rash. But I should be able to wash it off and recover from it. But now if we take a look at the very back of the abdomen, you'll see the shaded region right there. And that's where the spinnerets are. Now, they look like two throngs, and she's able to move these around. But she's not capable of ejecting out herself like Spider-Man. Instead, she needs to pull it out. She can pull it out using her back legs. The hairs on those legs can even work like a comb to straighten it out, so it doesn't get tangled and stuck together. As it comes out on multiple strands, and she can manipulate it into one. Now, spiders are even capable of creating up to seven different kinds of silk. So it's not just a sticky kind you might imagine being made up in webs. Even some webs are made up of multiple kinds. And for that matter, only 50% of spiders even make webs. So they all produce silk, but the silk will be used for other functions, like a sperm sac or egg sac, even parachuting, depending on the species. And what I have right here is some real silk created by our Haitian bird eater tarantula. Now spider silk is very strong, 10 times stronger than Kevlar. And the Aborigine people would get hold of this and use it to make fishing lines and fishing nets. They realized quite early on it was strong enough to hold up those little fish. So it's pretty amazing stuff. But getting back to little Brittany here, you all know I've been referring to her as that. The fact of the matter is, I have no idea if it is a boy or a girl. It's a little hard to tell at this stage. But they are sexually dimorphic. Now that means that the males and females have some different characteristics. Now with our tarantulas, the females can live up to 20 years, as opposed to only five for the males, so a quarter of that lifespan. They also tend to be a lot larger than the males. But our easiest way of telling them apart is that when the males become adults, they develop these big clubs on their pedipalps, and they use these in mating, almost like syringes. They actually soak up sperm from the sperm sac and place that onto the female. They're quite noticeable features, and in fact, if you take a look at our Mexican red knee tarantula at the end of the presentation, compare his petty pouch to the goliaths next to him, and you'll see how big and fat his are looking compared to hers. And it's still quite skinny and thin, but it does take a few years. This one's still young, so it could be Britney Spears or maybe Justin Timberlake or something like that. It's been a little while, but I just want to give her a little he she a quick break and show you a real molt of a tarantula. And I do have a molt here of the Haitian bird eater. So, spiders don't have an internal skeleton like we do. Their skeleton is on the outside of their body, hence so an exoskeleton. And in order to grow, they need to shed this. Now they're going to molt up to about eight times a year when they're young, and that will lessen year by year to only about once a year as an adult. And the process will take about two weeks, as they gradually build up fluid between the old and new cuticle, and that's what stretches them apart. So when this guy was ready, he popped open the carapace, which you can see there. And I want you to imagine that piece being on top of the cephalothorax there. Almost like the lid or the hood to it. So he kind of popped that open and then he just pulled himself out like a hand out of a glove. So the holes that you're seeing down here, that's where the legs used to be. So even though it looks like some of those legs are still intact, they're all completely hollow. And if we take a look down at the abdomen, you'll see four little distinct lines there. Those are just remnants of the book lungs. So this is basically where they were placed before it molted. But when I turn it around, you guys will get a great look at the fangs. Now can everyone see those? They're really shiny and they're pointed downwards, right? So that orientation is what separates your tarantulas from your common house spiders. And when they're pointed downwards like this, they're called megalomorphs. When they're pointed forwards, your true spider forms are called araniomorphs. That's a little fun fact for you guys to take to parties. Sounds super popular. <laughs> really geeky parties? The kind I go to, basically. 
right. I mentioned a little bit about the anatomy. Whoops, lost the limb. They can regrow those in multiple molds, so that's okay. All right, so, yeah, more of the Mexican red knee. And as you guys all know, we've got the live one just around the corner, but it's not going to grow to be this size. Yeah. However, the Goliath next to it is going to grow to be very close to this size, the leg span of a dinner plate. Those are the largest tarantulas in the world. So what we've got at the front here in those chelicerae is that venom gland which you can see in purple right here with the fangs just beneath that. But if we move to the cephalothorax region, which is like their head, we've got a sucking stomach. And you can see that in red just there. The stomach needs to be close to the mouth to regurgitate those digestive fluids easily. But if I move that aside, who can guess what this blue thing is? Come on, what do you think? Is like, yes, absolutely, it is their brain. So erosion of the brain, big cluster of neurons there. It looks like there are spokes coming out of it, but that's just a nerve going into each leg. And it's all closely connected to the eyes, which you can see at the top there. So the spider's stomach is on top of its brain. A little different from ours. It should be. And if we move to the abdomen, you'll see the heart. And that's the heart there. Very simple pumping mechanism closely connected to the book lungs, which you can see on the sides there. And we call them book lungs because they look a lot like books. It's almost like the pages in a book that increases that surface area, kind of like the alveoli in our lungs. Underneath that, we've got the digestive system in blue there. And underneath that, originally, this model had ovaries, but unfortunately, someone took those. <laughs> so we'll have to pretend it's a boy, I guess. Really Justin odd thing to take away with you, right? There you go. <laughs> Exactly. But then just beneath that we've got silk glands which you can see in orange there, closely connected to the spinnerets at the back. But some really interesting information about our spiders that I didn't even know when I started this is that their muscles are only capable of pulling in their limbs. Their muscles aren't capable of pushing them back out again. So can anyone guess how they do push their legs out? Any wild ideas or theories you guys would like to try out? <coughs> I'll give you a big clue, it's due to a form of pressure. What kind of pressure could it be? What's that? Pneumatic? What? Pneumatic? Not quite. So, I'll give the game away. It's due to their hydraulic system. So it's the blood pressure. So, basically to explain that, our spiders all have what we call an open circulatory system. So it's not closed like ours with veins and capillaries. That means it's just like a big soup in their bodies with their blood, which we call hemolymph. Their organs are mostly suspended within the fluid. Now, in order to exert out a limb, they change the pressure of this hemolymph, kind of like squeezing it into a limb to stretch it out, and their muscles just help pull them back in again. And when they're severely dehydrated, they're immobilized. The legs just tuck in underneath them. So a little unusual. Not quite the way we work, right? I'm getting a few nods there. I'll take the enthusiasm when I can get it. Thank you. <laughs> all right, but before you all run off, I've got something really fun in store, I swear. Now, I mentioned at the start, if you remember, that our tarantulas are arachnids and not the same as insects, right? Well, arachnid is a class in the same way that insecta is a class. And within that class, there are other orders, families, and species. And within arachnida, I'll show you just here, that includes lipugy, like camel spiders you might have seen on the news, your tailless with scorpions, your vinegaroons, your harvest men, also known as daddy long legs, your mites, and yes, your true scorpions, which you've got right there. And that is a real life emperor scorpion all the way from Central Africa. So you might instantly notice how shiny the exoskeleton is, right? Well, for one thing, they've got a waxy coating on it, which helps prevent water loss. That's what's really adding to the shine there. But they've also got a much harder exoskeleton than tarantulas. And that's a real vulnerability for tarantulas. If you were to drop one from just this height, it would likely die instantly from the impact. Whereas these guys can withstand a lot more pressure. And they've got eight legs like all other arachnids. It's just very hard to see the front legs because they're almost always covered by those huge claws. And it uses the claws to manipulate its prey. But if we look to the very front of the mouth, you'll see the mandibles. Now the scorpion uses those to tear off small pieces of food, but still like the tarantula, they also need to regurgitate digestive fluids as well. And they do have eyes, but they're on the sides of the cephalothorax, just here and here, but he's also got heat sensors at the very top of his head. And you can see that as a dimple just there. But who wants to tell me where the venom's located? 
the tail absolutely the tip of the tail you can see the stinger a little curled under bulbous and inflamed with that venom inside of it the venom gland is also within the tail some very clever predators have realized this and they tear off the tail before they eat the scorpion avoid that problem altogether but then if we take a look just at the sides of the body you should just about make out a really light gray area there. <clears throat> there we go. Now that's soft tissue. And that's slightly larger in females than in males. And when the females are pregnant, that will enlarge an even further as her young are growing inside of her. And then she'll have a live birth. So they don't have eggs like spiders do. Once she has that live birth, she'll make a great mother, carry her young around on her back until they're ready to leave her. However, if she does get very hungry and what happens to fall off, she might eat it. <laughs> Sometimes she's a good mother, sometimes a little dubious. But my favorite thing about scorpions, and a real mystery to scientists everywhere, is that they all produce chemicals in their hyaline layer, which is like their exoskeleton region, that fluoresce a really bright blue under UV light. Now it's a mystery because we don't quite understand what purpose this has, if any. Researchers are still looking into it. But we take advantage of this fact by going out at night, shining a UV light around, and they pop out in this incredible bright blue I'm going to show you guys right now. There you go, take a look at that. Which makes it a lot easier to find them late at night. And you will all be able to try this out yourselves on our very cool scorpion specimens that I have over here on our specimen cart. We've got some other very fun things to look at. So I highly recommend that. I'm going to give my critters a well-deserved break, but I'd love to take any questions you might have. But if you're shy and just want a closer look, please feel free to come on over to the table, guys. Thank you so much for listening. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Let's shine lights on scorpions.